Okay, so I'm recording. Megan, how you doing? I'm well, Glenn. Great to be with you. It is indeed a pleasure. This is Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. I'm a professor at Brown University, and uh, my uh, podcast is sponsored by the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs here at Brown. Uh, and I'm with Megan Down, uh, who is a writer. Uh, Megan is a columnist bi-weekly. Is that it? At Medium? Uh, yes. Is an uh, adjunct uh, professor at the School of the Arts at Columbia University. Did I get that right? Yep. And formerly uh, was a uh, opinion columnist at the Los Angeles Times for many years, has published a number of books. Most recently, this one, The Problem with Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars, which is out there. Uh, so we're going to talk about that and whatever else comes up here at the Glen Show. I'm really glad you could give us some time, uh, Megan. Thanks. Oh, thank you. So, okay. Um, What's new, in your opinion, about the culture wars? What, what, um, what are you getting at? Well, there is this punitive quality to them now. I mean, we used to associate this sort of uh, moralizing, and I hate to I hate to lapse into these terms because they've become such cliches now. But purity policing uh, that used to be associated with the right not too long ago. That was Jesse Helms, the religious conservatives, the evangelicals, and the left has taken this up uh, in the last couple of years. But the big difference is there's no redemption <laughs> in the in the left version. So uh, it's it's really more more extreme, you know. And I also, you know, part of the reason I wrote the book the way I did, and you know, we can address specific questions or issues, was that. You know, I, I did not want to just sort of say the obvious, the obvious things, make the obvious critiques and complaints about political correctness or identity politics, wokeness, which is now a term that is, I think, on its way out the door, hopefully. I really wanted to do a self-interrogation because I think if you're going to honestly engage in this, you have to be willing to look at your own blind spots and look at the conditions that have informed you. So that's what the book, the book is many things, but I think at its root, it's a self-interrogation. Okay, religion. Uh, you know, you remind me of my uh, friend and colleague, John McWhorter's uh, quip often about uh, well, he's, yes, that was, what's going on. A lot, very, very well. Uh, uh, racial justice, social justice, uh, climate uh, issues, uh, gender issues, uh, and all of that, uh, you either uh, are or are not on the right side of uh, of the uh, ledger on those. And uh, this is John. Uh, he says the uh, fervent uh, belief, the intensity of people's uh, defense of their perception of moral uh, rectitude uh, ongoing now, especially with social media, uh, has the feel of a religion to it. I mean, you just there's the hunt for heretics and all of this. So that's a. That's a metaphor. I don't know if it's anything more than that. Um, but uh, now, why aren't you um, simply uh, one of these people like me <laughs> who's been left behind by the times? Oh, Something tells me a reviewer is going to say this to you if they haven't done so already. Uh, you know, times have moved on. It's a younger generation out there right now of uh, the issues and you can name them. A woman's right to choose. I'm sure you're very intensely committed on that, but uh, perhaps uh, it's not as vivid for you as it would be for someone else. Uh, the transgender thing, this is a latter day thing. Uh, not everybody's on board with it. Uh, you know, uh, you've got some uh, reservations about Tallahassee Coates. I mean, really, come on, really? <laughs> I got all those ideas from you, though, Glenn. <laughs> you know, well, I was about to say, why doesn't this just date you? I thought he was great. Uh, as it you, dates you, me. Excuse me. <laughs> um, yes. So all those points you raise have been raised and will continue to be raised. And I think they're fair points to be raised. The thing is, there really is a, an incredibly wide and ever widening gulf between the people who are asking those kinds of questions in earnest, asking them in good faith, not just asking them rhetorically or to play devil's advocate, but people who really, really, really think that um, if you want to, if we want to, you know, 
be inclusive for trans people. We're not allowed to ask any questions about that. That if we want to support women, that we need to uh, approach Me Too in, in a completely uh, sort of unobjective, uncritical way. So, or objective, excuse me, that we need, that, you know, if we, we cannot be nuanced in any of these conversations. So there is that crowd that says, if we want to be on the right side of history, we really cannot afford any nuance. But frankly, that is a very tiny minority of people with outsized influence on social media. So I think the answer to your questions is, you know, why I think I'm still not too old to be asking these things is that it's not just older people who are asking these. I, younger people do. I have students that come to me in my office, I'm sure you do too, who say in private, there are things that I don't feel I can say in class. Writing, I feel I cannot produce because my peers will judge me in a certain way. So I don't think this really is that much of a genera generational dynamic as sometimes we're, we're framing it to be. It, it just sort of has to do with like, who is going to, who is going to uh, listen to their bullshit detector and who's not is the way I see it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do get the students coming into my office. That's definitely true. Um, I teach a class on race and inequality here at Brown. I have over 100 students registered for the class, and there are 75 or 80 in the room on any given day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we have all these hot button issues that come up, and they sit there staring at each other and staring at me. And I have to, you know, do the monologue thing for the 80 minutes of the class because nobody wants to dare step out. <laughs> I've said this here before. I'll repeat briefly. I asked the question, who in the room voted for Trump? And not a single hand went up out of uh, like 80 people. And I said, come on, this is very unlikely. I mean, it has to be like, we could do the math on this. The probability has to be less than 1% that Even a randomly Brown, selected right? person. Yeah, yeah. I'm at Brown, but come on, somebody voted for him. You know? <laughs> ironically, <laughs> or, you voted ironically for him, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, but I mean, we talk about things like reparations or, or we talk about, uh, you know, homicide in uh, black communities and uh, inner cities and stuff like that. Or, uh, you know, we talk about affirmative action. Now, you know, I'm saying uh, you got different test score standards for kids coming in. I mean, how do people feel about that? Uh, you know, you went to a prep school and, uh, you know, the black kid got into Yale and Princeton and Brown. And, you know, you ended up at uh, Cornell and you were lucky to get that, you know, kind of thing. How you feel about that? And they just sit there. They just sit there staring at me and staring at each other. They won't say a darn thing. And then come office hours, you know, they come around, close the door. And uh, Professor Lara, I'm very stimulated by your course. You're putting forward views that we don't hear very often. I, you know, and they kind of, they don't necessarily agree with anything that's conservative, but they do have questions. Uh, and, you know, yeah. they, don't feel, they don't feel safe to voice them in their own, with, when they're with their peers, at least not a lot of the time. Yeah, you know, it's really the fear of asking questions that bothers me more than more than anything. I mean, it's like we, we're not going to actually solve. It's this is so logical as to be as to be banal, but we're not going to solve the problems that we need to solve if we're not allowed to ask questions. And somehow we've entered this moment where asking questions equals being skeptical, and being skeptical equals like not seeing people, erasing them. And then that, of course, means harm. So we get, it's a very short road from asking questions to harming. And that to me is uh, like, that no, goes nowhere good. Harming, harming by failing to show solidarity with, harming by appearing to be unaware of the hurtful feelings that are engendered by your critical stance. Uh, harming by giving aid and comfort to people that we know are real enemies. Don't you understand what's happening in this country, uh, et cetera? And so even your uh, abstractly uh, 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 plausible question in actual political fact becomes a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. Yeah, and it's it's dehumanizing. I mean, frankly, to you know, I, I say this in the book, to deny people their their complications and their confusions and their contradictions is to deny them their humanity. That's what's denying people their humanity. It's not this sort of 
you know, ambient, oh, I'm, I'm failing to, to, I'm not seeing you, I'm not seeing uh, the struggles you've gone through. It, you know, it, it's, it's really like if you want to actually treat someone as an equal, you will just see that they're as kind of screwed up as everybody else, right? I mean, that's kind of, it's, it, that's what we're missing here. So, but anyway, I can, t I can talk to you about the, uh, I don't know where you want to go with this. I have a, it's, it's, it's interesting because the book has been out for about a month now and I, I'm t starting to talk about it differently than I was a month ago. The, um, the conversations that, that I've had around it uh, and the way it's been received is, is it's like its own book or something. Okay. Well, for, for, why don't you start by letting you take a minute or two to uh, tell people who might not have had the pleasure of, as I have done, uh, spending some time with your book you know, basically what the project is about. It, it feels to me like a little bit memoir. You're obviously an essayist, a talented one, I might, I might add. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're, you're taking on the, the feminist argument, which I must confess to you, I feel completely unqualified and illegitimate to even uh, entertain any of the questions that you take up, but there's some fascinating stuff going on. I'm surprised you know, to hear that. <laughs> you're surprised that I feel unqualified to talk yeah. about why? About, <laughs> it's because you're a man or some or some other reason? Yeah, because I'm a man, a little bit like some of these kids, the white kids in my class feel uncomfortable talking about their reservations about reparations or whatever. Right. I see Me Too stuff going down and I cringe. I mean, on a regular basis, I see stuff happening, some of it happening to people that I really care about that I just feel is, you know, out of control. I feel like I want to say witch hunt, witch hunt, except Donald J. Trump has made that word unusable uh, yeah. by any self-respecting person. But I want to say, what the heck is going on here? I literally was driven back to reading Arthur Miller's The Crucible one night. Literally, it took yeah. me an hour to find the book in my on my bookshelf, searching around, where's this book? And I sat down and I read the whole play right. okay, in one sitting. It sounded like a report in the newspaper. Yeah, you can't believe it, right? You changed the names, like changed the labels, but it was some it is, very similar right. feeling stuff. Yep. So can a guy actually say anything? I mean, it, it's got to be, uh, it, it's, it's got to <laughs> be you. <laughs> well, increasingly, I don't know. I think, I think white women are the new white men here, so I'm not sure... Uh, I can't even say anything at this point. White, uh, cisgendered, uh, heterosexual right. women, not to get too personal, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, uh, I, I will tell you a little bit about the origins of this book. So I started off writing it well before the Trump election. I mean, I started thinking about this stuff, uh, you know, some, somewhere around 2015 or so, I started to notice that online, uh, a lot of the way that my progressive left-leaning friends and colleagues were expressing their frustrations and, and their views of the world, it just didn't resonate with me. I didn't quite know what they were talking about. And a lot of it was around issues um, around women. So, you know, we had this idea that somehow uh, we we're living in a, in such an oppressive patriarchy that, you know, just being a woman who gets out of bed every morning and goes to work and pays her rent uh, and, you know, fights off the man is a badass or something. There was like this rhetoric around it and you saw it on Twitter a lot. And it, it didn't, it's just sort of like, it was, there was a real hyperbole to it. And then it became these memes like, you know, Oh, hashtag ban men or I drink male tears and, you know, it was ironic. It was clearly ironic. It's no, no reasonable person would be taking it literally, but, uh, you know, ironic misandry would be called. But I just thought it was strange that, you know, we were in a, a time where women had, have never been safer, never been better educated, um, never had more access to opportunity, and in the aggregate are doing better than men, much better than men, going to graduating from college at much higher rates. You know, you yeah. know all this as an yeah. economist. Um, obviously, in the you know in the highest corridors of power, white men are still in power. So yes, but in the broad scope of things, women were doing far better than men. And so I thought it was a strange uh, sort of paradox that, that that was the reality. And yet the expression online was really rooted around this idea that women were this kind of underclass. And this was, again, early 2016, well before anybody thought Trump was, you know, he, <laughs> he was not a glimmer in anyone's eye. And we assumed Hillary would be the president. 
So I started writing this book and it was going to be just this kind of short manifesto called You Are Not a Badass. And it was just going to be kind of jabbing at these memes and sort of looking at this and, and, you know, kind of asking myself why I wasn't really relating to this as a Gen Xer. Why was there a divide between millennial women and Gen X women? And then the election happened and, uh, you know, the, the entire conversation changed in too many ways to possibly count. But one thing that happened was that the left started using the Trump emergency as a sort of excuse not to have complicated conversations in any way, not just about women. It became this sort of larger ethos of what I call a conversational conversational chokehold. I, I don't even want to use the word wokeness anymore because it's reductive. It's insulting almost to lots of people. But, okay. but there it's was a conversational chokehold uh, in, in the, in the, in our midst. And we couldn't, there was, it was this idea that we needed all hands on deck. We couldn't afford any kind of nuance or any kind of like conversation about strategy. It was all outrage and the resistance movement. Uh, it just seemed to me that it was not, uh, really serving us on, on a strategic level in some way. So, so the book really expanded then to be not just about feminism, but about this larger, uh, this, this larger question of why are we, why are we forbidding ourselves and others from asking certain questions? Why is this, why is this stuff pointing in the wrong direction sometimes? It's not just about, you know, has me too gone too far? Has the Trump resistance gone too far? It's more like, is it pointing in the right direction? So, so that's really what the book then became. So the, the feminist angle, it, it dominates a lot of it. Frankly, because like I'm a white chick and I'm not allowed to write about a lot of other stuff, but um, it, it definitely expands beyond just that conversation. Okay, I can hear, and in fact, I did read. I read Ryu uh, Spaeth's uh, review of your book in the New Republic. Uh, I read Emily Witt's uh, review of your book in the New Yorker, and uh, I can imagine how this argument is going to go more broadly in the reception of your book, which is this is reactionary. Uh, you know, uh, these movements are messy. Uh, yes, there's excess zealotry, of course. There's, that's the case with any movement. Take a look at history. Uh, the status quo ante against which these expressions of uh, anti-patriarchy or whatever are directed uh, is awful. Things are beginning to open up and change. Um, you're going to have to break some eggs if you want to make an omelet. There are going to be some innocent victims along the way if we get if we root out the sexual predators. Um, and there are going to be some mobs in the street. Have you noticed that every transformation of society that was worth a damn in the last 200 years has involved some mobs in the street? Uh, so th this is a kind of, uh, you know, you're picking low-hanging fruit, you're you know, cherry picking the worst uh, excesses. You're you're carping about uh, second order things and not about first order things. Mm -hmm. And it really raises some questions about where you stand. Yeah, right. I, I, <laughs> I think you're just telling me that to be uh, to be uh, to be uh, skeptical or to even to be to ask questions meant that you were alt right now. <laughs> it's like the the scale has just. The, 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 this has been recalibrated to such a shocking degree. Um, look, am I a reactionary? I think I'm a person who's responding. There's a difference between reacting and responding. And I would like to think, you know, the book is really, really careful. It's funny. One of the other criticisms was that I didn't go far enough. It's like, oh, you do all the, you know, you, you, you do all these gymnastics and you're trying to see the other side and you're self-flagellating and you're going through all of this. And so, you know, you didn't do enough on one side. So to me, and I learned this as a columnist, you know, 10 years as an opinion columnist, I always thought, well, it, you know, if, if I write a column where both sides don't hate me, it's a failed column. So that's really <laughs> the job of, but, of an opinion but, haver. But I, I think, excuse me, General, I think what that's about is uh, people think you're trying to have it both ways. They think on the one hand, you want to say, me two excesses, and then you want to uh, illustrate. Uh, and on the other hand, you want to say you believe women. Well, you know, uh, where, are you, where do you really stand? I mean, isn't that what a lot of this self-censorship, political correctness stuff is all about? It's about... 
Well, people wanting to reassure other people about where they stand, about virtue signaling yeah, and whatnot. Because and, we can't, we've sort of become unable to metabolize nuance. I mean, I think it's very difficult for a lot of people in the sort of cultural criticism space to understand the difference between taking on a certain subject and endorsing the subject. I don't know why it's almost, it's like this failure of we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Like this is sort of like a basic skill that, that I, I'm noticing difficulty with. Um, yeah, I do want to have it both ways. I want to have it always because I want to look at it from a lot of different points of view. I mean, isn't that, that's what we do as, as public thinkers and as writers, I, I'm not a polemicist. So, you know, this is not a book that's going to be a polemic on one side or the other. There are lots of those kinds of books. And the reason that I, that I did this book in this particular way was I just felt my own sort of my, the particular skill set that I bring to writing and thinking is, is more inclined um, in this direction. So, but you know, do I believe, do I believe and believe all women? No, I, I believe in listening to all people and making a decision. Believe all women is a sexist proposition. I mean, that's assuming that women have a moral authority just by definition that men don't have. And that's infantilizing and, and sexist. So, and again, this is something that I would think the vast majority of people, men, women, all class levels, all races, all walks of life would just see that as pretty logical. <laughs> well, well, the, women have, uh, again, uh, I feel disqualified or un fit to enter into this conversation. I think you should but, just get, this is a, you're not, this is a safe space, Glenn. I think okay, you should. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead. No, not you, but the world. I, I but, know. But, but what I was going to say was, uh, what about the position that, yes, women, in fact, do have some moral authority and were to be believed in virtue of the fact that uh, they are, you are, uh, victims uh, too often have been of, uh, of a kind of patriarchal uh, hegemony. And uh, what is meant by the phrase believe women is an expression of solidarity with the victims of this large uh, set of historical forces. Well, then I think we should be more precise with our language. Believe any monolithic group, again, that, that denies them the humanity of their of their contradictions and confusions. I just, you know, there's, there is this sense somehow, I don't think being, you know, being historically a victim, does that make you by definition uh, a, a more virtuous person? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would say so. no to that question, but I, I think it would not be obviously uh a no for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, one of the things too, and I mean, I want to, I feel like maybe we need to be a little more specific. I mean, what I talk yeah. about in the book is, so I was born in 1970. Okay. So I grew up right alongside second wave feminism. I was three years old when Roe v. Wade, you know, was passed. I remember in 1982, sitting at the kitchen table with my mother talking about how the ERA hadn't passed and she was really sad about that. My mother was a real second wave feminist. And, you know, the thing about growing up in the seventies and the eighties was that if you were a girl, you just had the sense that it was better to be a girl than a boy. Like there was, there was something about the way children just were a sort of, there was a sort of a sense of androgyny around childhood at that time. Like there weren't as many specific boy toys versus girl toys. Everybody watched the bad news bears. You know, everyone watched the, I talk a lot about this kids show zoom that you probably don't remember, but a lot of kids, a lot of people in my generation remember this show. It came out of WGBH in Boston. I have kids in your generation. Okay. So maybe Nathan. you watched zoom. Did you have I zoom think I probably came across it. Yeah. You had it on in your house. Okay. So, so you know, one of the, the theories that I posit in the book is, you know, maybe Gen Xers are not really, um, we, we don't recognize some of the conditions that millennials and Gen Zers went through just because we had the advantage of this sort of um, second wave feminist influenced childhoods that really, really uh, just did not emphasize huge gender differences. Like it was cool to be a tomboy. Like the biggest child movie star of the 1970s was Jodie Foster. Okay. Everyone wanted to be her, you know, just out lesbian now, Christy McNichol, another one, same thing. So, so I, the more I started to think about why my generation emphasizes resilience and toughness, we were all about being cool and tough. And then when the me too discussions come up, 
people my age tend to say, well, hey, millennials, just just toughen up, just hit them over the head with your shoe and, you know, run out of there. Why can't you call a cab? I think there's truth to that. But I also think that we need to be mindful of the different sets of conditions that they had. When, when millennials were growing up, there were, you know, there were like pink toy aisles and boy, boy toy aisles in the toy store. There was real girliness emphasized. They grew up into like Girls Gone Wild, this raunch. They had ubiquitous online pornography that I think is a huge, huge factor that people my age didn't have to deal with. And so I think, you know, a lot of in the book is, is wrestling with this and, and looking at what might be my own blind spots and, and my cohorts blind spots and trying you, to reconcile that. What do you think the impact of pornography has been? Just as a, a side question. I think, well, I think that, and this is, I mean, I've read a lot about this, but this is still a largely anecdotal answer. I think that it's, it changes people's expectations about what is pleasure and what is, you know, a, a sex act you might do with somebody you don't know very well, for instance. Like I hear a lot of stories and a lot of these issues of consent yeah. come up around what sorts of what sorts of sexual acts uh, would be quote unquote normal or would be like something that you would assume somebody would want to do. And like people my age hear these stories of like what goes on with people 20 years younger. And it's just like, what really? I've never even heard. I don't even, I've never heard of that. So I think that just we have to, people my age have to just be mindful of the fact that they're dealing with things that we didn't. And I, you know, on the consent thing, like it's easy to laugh about affirmative consent and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I've really come around in the process of writing this book. My feeling on that is like, it's not up for my generation to, to tell younger generations how to practice sexual consent. Like that's their thing. So I'm not going to, not going to die on that hill. That's kind of none of our business. But, you know, I still think that there's something to be said for this conversation around resilience. And, and we might give them a little bit of our resilience and we could take from them a little bit of their obsession with fairness, perhaps. Again, I'm, I'm loath to uh, consent. <laughs> so, so here's an old geezer, uh, reactionary male, African-American, uh, used to be a Christian uh, kind of uh, take, which is that, uh, so it, the, the interaction between a man and a woman in an intimate setting is a kind of negotiation. Uh, a lot of things are spoken, but not everything can or should be spoken at some level, uh, trying to be explicit and formally contractual about every aspect of that interaction it 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 kills the thing that you're trying to to protect there because <laughs> it then it becomes something that it wasn't it wasn't before and that and that uh the the question is what do you do when you know someone says uh you know I'm I'm not interested in that and whatnot but uh the ex post facto reconstruction of the event when they didn't say that as uh nevertheless they were violated because of something that happened where yeah. you had no idea that it wasn't it wasn't wanted in the first place. Right. That that, that strikes me as as uh, you know as profoundly problematic and uh, on a level of fairness to, uh, to an accused party who's more often than not going to be male. But it also seems to me to be um, a stifling of the of the kind of uh, intimate uh, dynamic that that one would want to somehow cherish in that setting. I don't know if any of that makes sense to you. No, but it, makes, no my... it, makes, it makes perfect sense. And I mean, I will just say, I have a lot to say about that, but I will just briefly preface it by saying, you know, most of the young people I talk to, they say, well, look, it's not like we have the, can I touch you here? Can I touch you here? Conversation every time. It's like an initial thing. And then if you're in a relationship with somebody, it's just as normal as it, as it ever was. Okay. So that's, that's what they will say. And I have no reason to disbelieve them, but you know, I, I do think that it comes back again to this, this infantilization phenomenon. I mean, why is it that we, we are going to accept, you know, we're, we're going to accept a woman who says, Oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know what happened. And I'm rethinking this and I think it might be a violation. So I'm going to accuse this guy. And like, if a guy did the same thing, he's just going to be called a wuss. Like we still have a real double standard here. 
And I, again, my feminism, like the feminism that I grew up and I still consider myself a feminist, is about holding women and men to account in the same way. Like that's equality. So, you know, I have a whole section in the book and it's, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it's, I, I, I mean it. And it's a section that's gotten a lot of criticism. And I talk about this idea of toxic femininity. <laughs> so if we're going to bandy around terms like toxic masculinity, which is a stupid term that doesn't really mean anything anyway, but it's all over the place. If we're going to have that, then if you're really going to be not sexist, we need to acknowledge toxic femininity. And, and one of the things that could conceivably fit into that category is the woman who pressures a man into having sex with her when he doesn't really want to, and he doesn't want to hurt her feelings. So he goes along with it and he feels kind of gross afterwards flip that around and that could easily be a scenario in which a woman accuses somebody, but you would never think of it that way. Like, you know, the, the, the stereotypes around men are such that, Oh, she's doing him a favor by forcing him into having sex with her, you know? And I just think we should think about this. Okay. Stuff. So, so let's, let's, uh, let's uh, pursue this for a minute because I was struck by uh, some of this that I read in your book. You say um, many men, may be correctly accused of thinking that women owe them sex within a relationship. A woman is obligated to provide sex in a relationship, but many women may be guilty of a related uh, sin, which is thinking that men should be so grateful that uh, they they're getting the sex that, uh, you know, they're doing them a favor. Right. Uh, and then you go into a discussion of uh, incidents that you, this is not a social science book, so you don't have data, but you talk about <laughs> anecdotally about incidents yeah. in which, you know, guys tell you stories about a girl slipping into the sleeping bag on a camping trip or putting a hand on an organ in a uh, bus ride or something like that. And uh, one of these reviewers that I was reading just slams you. And I want to know how you react. The, the slam is, come on, really? That's the problem. Girls slipping in the guys uh, uh, sleeping bags on camping trips when the real problem is, you know, one in five women have been raped on college campuses <laughs> and so forth and so on. <laughs> Sexual violence and uh, all of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, how do you respond to that? Well, I would respond to that, that it, uh, it, it is a problem because it's an intellectual dishonesty. It's an example of the same kind of intellectual dishonesty that comes into banding around statistics like, one in five women are raped on campus. So like that is, a, I call those like statistical slogans, right? You want a yeah. one in five women raped or, uh, you know, I, the, the, you, you know, you just see these all over the place and, you know, you've got Joe Biden and Barack Obama were throwing around those statistics. So, you know, yeah. the, the very thought process, you know, that goes into saying, well, this is not part of the problem. Who cares if these women are sl slipping in these guys' sleeping bags? That's the same kind of lazy thinking that just allows these these sort of articles of faith to to go on. And I would say, like, okay, if sexual assault does, is something that happens on campus and it does need to be addressed, and the way it needs to be addressed is we need to define clearly what is sexual assault. So the one in five thing, first of all, that was the one in five women raped never ever in any original form in any sort of you know data set had to do with women being raped on campus. There's data that says one in five women will be sexually assaulted um, in her lifetime or between the ages of something and, I don't know, 30 or something. And statistically, you're more likely to be college aged at that time. But then you're also defining sexual assault as anything from, from rape to being groped at a party. Does that mean we should condone being groped at a party? No, <laughs> but we're not doing ourselves any favors by just, you know, being hyperbolic about, about statistics and just then like kind of advancing, almost reveling in this idea that the world is so, so, so unsafe for women that one in five women are assaulted and therefore we can't have any kind of like, I think interesting and, and useful conversation about the difference between a woman slipping into a man's sleeping bag and the other way around. Like, I want to have that conversation. I think it's interesting and I think it's important. But the fact is we can't have it because you can use the one in five as a weapon to just stop the whole conversation. Well, I must tell you, I fail to see how there could possibly be any principled defense of a distinction 
between uh, X gets into Y's sleeping bag without Y's consent, turning on whether or not X is male and Y female or vice versa or both the same or whatever. What happened was I was in my sleeping bag, male or female, and someone entered it without my consent. That's either bad or it's not, no matter who these parties are. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm hard pressed to see how there could be any defense. Uh, now, there may be behavioral differences. The guy might not say anything because he wants to have sex more frequently as a statistical matter uh, than the girl would under uh, opposite circumstances. But uh, it's true, isn't it? That uh, just, just common sense, right? A guy goes around complaining uh, you know, this girl slipped in my sleeping bag without my consent. Everybody's going to laugh at that. And that's actually part of toxic masculinity. <laughs> Whereas if a girl right. says it, it's rape. I mean, right. it's, you know, it's a right. capital crime. And it's, and I, you know, it's worth saying, if you want to think about ideas like toxic masculinity, whatever you want to call it, I would say that men feeling like it would be emasculating to complain about a woman sleep, slipping into their sleeping bag would fall under that category. Yeah, that's, that's a stereotype. It's, it's an example of, things that we expect from men or that we don't expect from them or that we don't tolerate from them. You know, it's a, for a long time, you know, ever since, you know, second wave feminism came along, the, you know, the range of expression and the range of acceptable behavior for women has been quite much wider than it has been for, for men. Um, so I, I think that like, it's just, you know, I think what's what excites me about this book is the thing that frustrates my critics, which is that I'm really not advocating for anything more than free discussion. I want to talk about these like really, to my mind, urgent and compelling uh, topics. And I want to be able to do so freely and, and uh, sort of safely without being accused of being a bigot or whatever it is. And so um, again, it really comes back to this this chokehold that has been put on the public discourse. Let me ask you about something else in the book that struck me. You you spent some time telling us about a relationship that you had when you were living in New York City in your 20s, if I've got this right, where you were working somewhere and there was a guy who, an older guy, I think he's married, uh, he's successful, higher up in the company than you are. And uh, he likes to take you out to dinner from time to time. And he issues these invitations and you accept these invitations and you go to dinner from time to time. Although if I get, if I get this right, correct me, you feel a little bit creepy about it because kind of the guy probably is thinking about trying to hit on you or something or has some interest that is not entirely appropriate. And um, I'm wondering what, I mean, and you take some pages to tell us about this. What do you want us to take away from this confession about your involvement in this kind of relationship and, and so on? I want people more than anything in that section to think about power and think about how we've been talking about power and think about what, what it really means. I mean, to me, power is shifting all the time. It's fluid. It's going back and forth. So this was a case where... I, I would never, I, I, I would never have put this in any category of Me Too. Um, this was never anything I thought of as a quid pro quo situation. I was accepting these invitations because I thought it would be somehow professionally self-sabotaging not to. I was very ambitious young <laughs> aspiring writer at that time uh and everything was about contacts i mean this was before social media you you made yourself by you know any way you you worked your ass off and you you networked as much as you could and not not social networking online so yeah i would i would um i would accept these guys invitation we would have dinner uh started off as lunch then became dinner and you know i I would, I confess that I would, you know, there were times where I was flirtatious with him. I was kind of, I, I didn't, he would ask me questions about myself and I didn't want to answer. So I would deflect them by asking questions about him. And, you know, it was this whole game back and forth. And, you know, the fact is I could have made one phone call and made his life incredibly difficult. Like the, the power was really with me. And I want to be clear, he did not, we actually did not work at the same company. It's, he did not have direct authority over me. Um, but, you know, the reason I told the story, and I actually had not even thought about this guy in, in a very long time, was that in the wake of Me Too, 
everyone's on Facebook telling their stories, all these women I know talking about what they remember. And somebody started talking about um, a, a man from that era who would take these young women out to lunch and dinner. And, and she was describing it. And I thought, well, that's weird. That sounds kind of like the guy, you know, I remember, but it can't be the same guy because I never felt threatened by that. And I can't, that's just not right. That just doesn't seem right. And I was in such denial about it that it actually took like several days of watching this Facebook thread go down. And I messaged the person who started it. And I said, who are you talking about? And she said, yes, of course it was the same person. But I, I put it in the book by way of trying to, to parse what it is that makes some people feel a certain way about a situation and makes other people feel a different way. And it's just, it's temperament. It's, it's where you are in that time and space. Uh, and I guess my point really is we can't just be blunt instruments about this. Like all of these conversations are very, very subtle and we, and we would do well to recognize that at every, every step of the way as we're talking about them. So here's how I imagine someone might uh, try to rebut this, the problem with subtlety in this situation. You say power. So, uh, yeah, whose power, his or yours? Uh, well, you think that it might be helpful to your career in some way to be in his good graces. And so you are willing to entertain spending time with him in a manner that maybe isn't entirely appropriate under the circumstance. But you wink, you kind of yeah. look the other way, you kind of. You know, but he's got the power. He's this powerful man. He is, you're you're in a way, I mean, it's not like uh, he's going to retaliate against you if you don't respond favorably, but you're kind of induced into doing something only because he has power. So that's one kind of power. Yeah. But another kind of power is um, uh, you have the ability because of these ambiguous encounters to characterize them in a way either years after the fact or at the time as somehow invasive or unwelcome and were you to do so then he would be certainly now he would be in uh, trouble could well be in trouble could cost him his career uh his marriage um so uh that's that's power and then it strikes me that there's another kind of power <laughs> which is that you're 25 or however old you are and you've yeah. got a good body, assuming that you've got one uh, without any uh, uh, inappropriate intention here. <laughs> but but just to say people are attracted to other people. And when they're 25 years old, that's a lot of power uh, in the sexual marketplace. Uh, so, you know, who's the victim? What's going on? It, it is. It's starting to look kind of nuanced in there. Maybe. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. And I mean, I say, in the, I say in the book, I came, you know, I would go to these dinners and I would you know, he would like give me money for cab fare and I would, I would pocket it and take the subway home. You know, I was so broke all the time, you know, that I was, you know, living in that way. And I would come home and, and my roommate would be up and I would be grousing around and I'd say, Oh God, that, this guy, why did I, you know, he's, he's so annoying. And she just looked at me and she said, well, you keep showing up. So you must be getting something out of it. And it's just, I think that's, that's a really pertinent question. And like, again, I don't want to be, to be sure, let's be clear. There are, there are extreme cases. I think Me Too has been a net positive. I am in no way insinuating that, that we should just look the other way. Somebody like Harvey Weinstein is obviously a monster. I mean, this is a, this is a spectrum here, but I think that's like, you know, we can't just kind of, uh, just, we, we, we can't, it's not, I, sometimes I get the feeling that like, everyone kind of wants to get in the game. <laughs> so they're going to conjure up something that may or may not really fit into this, into this category and then, and then kind of use it as like, uh, so, you know, I, you know, I, I'm part of this too. But, but what are you going to say again? I can hear the critic. They're going to say, but there are women who are, so as you say, there's a spectrum. Uh, there are women who are um, being, uh, you know, preyed upon or exploited or whatever by by powerful men, and and you and, and the cases are not always going to be black and white. The cases are going to involve gray, and it's a matter of interpretation. And when we say believe women, in a way, in a in a way, what we're saying is allow the woman to have the defining narrative about how we're supposed to look at the situation. And it's a counterweight. It's a counterweight to the power that the 
that the uh, man has uh, in within the organization, within the profession, whatever it might be. And and what you're doing is you're giving uh, you're giving ammunition uh, to these uh, to these exploiting men, allowing them to counter the woman's narrative with a well, you know. Uh, there were two of us here. It was complicated. She was playing along to a certain degree, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's a slippery slope. And where it ends is with you being a rape apologist. <laughs> I'm not the first to tell me that. Um, well, you know, the, the women that actually feel the most strongly uh, in favor of how I'm looking at this and the women who have come to me and written to me and said, thank you. We need to be going about this really carefully are the women that have had really bad experiences with sexual harassment in the workplace, you know, just having to leave companies, you know, real physical altercations, uh, serious repercussions. And the, the Me Too movement has been, you know, revolutionary. And, you know, this is one of the things that that Ashley Banfield was ranting on about when the, when the Aziz Ansari case broke, you know, if, if you care about me too, if you take this seriously, uh, you got to care about due process. And so when this leaves the realm of due process and it's always, you know, we're going to default to believe the w woman's narrative, no matter what, again, that's infantilizing women. And it's just really not how our system works. <laughs> So, I mean, we have cases on college campuses, I'm, sh I'm sure you know this, where, you know, the, 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 the procedure when an accusation was made yeah. was that the, the man did not know who was accusing him, was not allowed a lawyer. I mean, these yeah, were kangaroo courts. And uh, Betsy DuVos, of all people, <laughs> rolled back a lot of those guidelines, you know. So I, I guess I would say to, to my critics, um, I, I would just be, be very careful about using blanket uh, condemnations of, of people who are calling for nuance because there are, there are blanket uh, adjudication processes that, that help no one in the end and, and go and completely against the grain of our, of our system. Let me give you a contrasting case. I don't know what you will think about it in which I think nuance <laughs> is very hard to come by. Police officers interacting with uh, young black men in uh, cities and uh, the nature of an encounter becomes violent. And uh, a police officer fears for his life, her life, and they discharge their weapon. Uh, now, the police officer is white and the person is unarmed who gets shot and they're, and they're black. And there's a bunch of facts. Now, there are a couple of ways of reacting to that. One of them is yet another instance of uh, open season. Uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, Crump's, Benjamin Crump's new book. This is the lawyer who represented the Trayvon Martin family represented the um, some of the other uh, families who've been victims of police shooting. You know, it's open season on, on uh, black people. This is what's happening. And another answer is it's hard to be a cop and uh, you don't have uh, the luxury when you have to make decisions in a split second about all of this uh, ex post facto stuff and uh, accidents happen. And, uh, you know, uh, you got to put it in context. Now, if that's that's so politically charged, I mean, and I guess the point I'm trying to illustrate with this example is, that, you know, we're not in logic 101 here. We're out in the real world of politics and it paints with big, broad strokes. It paints and it doesn't paint in a lot of subtle, you know, kind of thing. It paints in big, broad images and narratives and whatnot. And uh, carping, nitpicking, uh, hair splitting, uh, or nuance uh, is uh, appropriate to certain circumstances, but not when you're trying to actually move the needle on something as important as how the state deploys force against a, a community of color. Michael Bloomberg, how did uh, Charles Blow put it? I don't know if you saw his recent column on Bloomberg. He says, nobody should vote for Bloomberg uh, because of stop and frisk. And at the end of the column, he says something like, I don't want to have anything to do with you if you support Michael Bloomberg which in a way circles back to your point a minute. And I read that and I said, although I don't support Bloomberg, I said to myself, who gives a shit whether or not you want to have something to do with it? Who do you think you are right. that you can shame me by de de declaring, you know, and I have no brief for Bloomberg actually, here, yes. but, but in any case, you see, what I'm getting at. you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. You know, Glenn, I actually was thinking about this. Do you remember that musical Avenue Q? 
No, I don't. Early aughts. So this was a musical. It was on Broadway. It was a big hit. It was critically acclaimed. It was puppets. Uh, it was making fun <laughs> of Sesame Street. Uh-huh. And uh, it was about, you know, these, you know, people in the neighborhood and very diverse and everything. But, um, you know, there was a song in it called Everyone's a Little Bit Racist. <laughs> this was a musical that won Tony Awards. I mean, this was acclaimed. This was highbrow culture. And, um, you know, the puppets, they, they sang this song and it went, it went, bigotry has never been exclusively white. If we could all just admit that we're a little bit racist, even though we all know it's wrong, maybe it would help us all get along. I think everyone's a little bit racist sometimes. Doesn't mean we go around committing hate crimes. Look around and you will find no one's really cover, colorblind. Maybe it's a fact we should all face. Everyone makes judgments based on race. Now, that was 2003. That won a Tony Award. Wow. Okay? Yeah. And that... That's I mean, not going to pass the Ibram Kendi test these days. or It those. might not pass. I, and it might be... I wonder if, if that would be considered hate speech. I mean, my students, I love them. But, like, if yeah. I was to... Uh, like show them a clip from that, I think they would get very upset. I, as it was, I showed them a clip from Team America and I think they had to go to the hospital afterwards. But, yeah. uh, so, you know, this whole thing, it's like everyone's making about judgments about everybody in all kinds of ways all the time. <laughs> and I just feel like, you know, whether it's gender, whether it's race, and this is where I get nervous. Like I'm a white chick here talking about race. Like my blood pressure goes up a little bit the same way maybe yours does talking about women. So, I, I just, it's like, you know, you, you see somebody, you're making a whole series of judgments based on a million things. And it seems to me that if we're going to, if we're going to improve something like policing, if we're going to improve, uh, if we're going to do better with sexual assault on college campuses, we need to look at this more holistically. Uh, and that starts with asking the right questions. They are actually starting to do that around sexual assault. There's a, um, there's a, a pilot program at Columbia that I have really high hopes for that seems very comprehensive and very smart, takes into account the backgrounds of people who tend to, you know, make accusations, what's informing it. So I would, I wow. wonder if there's a version of this around policing. Wow. Like it it takes it. It takes, this is about adjudicating Title IX type cases at Columbia, taking into account an accuser's history. Like, is somebody, is somebody who, for instance, somebody who is on, um, somebody who grew up not privileged is more likely to be in a situation where they are accusing somebody of sexual assaults or they feel they were assaulted, they were assaulted, whatever it is. And I think that what this, and I don't want to speak for this study, this is extremely broad brush, but my understanding is that it's really going back and saying, okay, what are the circumstances that is going to make somebody vulnerable in a number of different ways um, to, to getting into a situation where they feel that they don't have control and they can't get out of it? I see. And I think that's, those are the kinds of questions that we need to ask. And the thing is that we can't, I'm amazed they even got far enough to ask those questions because if you ask them, then you're saying, oh, well, you're blaming the victim. <laughs> we can't even have a conversation about that. You know, the biggest risk factor for being sexually assaulted is having been previously sexually assaulted. Okay. <laughs> That's true. But you can't even say that because, oh, you're, you're blaming women. You're blaming the victim. No, we're actually making an observation that could uh, lead to change and help people. I didn't understand that in your book. Uh, you briefly make this uh, observation and you say somebody says it's like they can smell it or something like that. Oh, these, yeah. these. Yes. What does that mean? That the person has an affect that somehow conveys the fact that they're vulnerable? I don't understand what no, that means. Well, I mean, if you're a, this is not a this is not a novel concept. So, you know, if you are somebody who's been victimized, if you're a victim of childhood sexual trauma, um, I mean, there's data on this. You're more likely to, you, you just, you, you end up sort of attracting people and being attracted to people who are likely to re-victimize you. Um, and this is not some mystical thing. It just okay. has to do with, you know, behaviors that are unconscious and instilled. So, so it does put some responsibility on the victim, although not uh, not culpability. No, I, yeah, 
but I mean, that's like saying, uh, you know, if you if you were immunocompromised uh, at right. one time, you're more likely to get sick later. I, I don't think this is a judgment. I, it's, but I, but again, it's it's really really worth recognizing and looking into because that's that kind of approach seems to me to actually have a fighting chance of making a difference as opposed to just saying, oh. Uh, you know, we got to get rid of toxic masculinity. We have to teach men not to rape. What does that mean? You think we're teaching them to rape? Yeah, they would say yes. But it, but these are just, to me, these are like empty statements. And and we're hiding behind these empty statements because they feel, they feel political. They feel good. They signal that we're in, we're in the club with the other people. Like, I think ultimately... I think ultimately people are lonely. Like they, you, you know, if you want to make, <laughs> you get, I think so. Like there's a real loneliness out there. So in order to, to combat that, you want to be in a club and the way you be in a club is just sort of say the obvious thing over and over again. On, on and social. get a lot of retweets and a lot of likes and so Yeah. On. Yeah. Okay, pussy hats. You don't like them, or you didn't. My, <laughs> my like wife, my me. wife, <laughs> on our second date wore a pussy hat. I don't oh, know. Oh boy. Uh, we've been married for two years and and change. Uh, so <laughs> uh, she's gonna want you to uh, answer the question. What's wrong with a pussy hat? I uh, <laughs> I uh, don't look. I don't like any sort of identity movement that uh, has to advertise itself all the time. I just don't like self-advertising. And I look, that's one of those sections in the book. I'm making fun of myself. I mean, I, I, I am just somebody who uh, I, I don't, I, I feel personally like it would be great if we could just not even give this catnip to the other side. We could just go out there and, and, you know, make our point in this very dignified way. I guess I'm into respectability politics when it comes to women. Uh, and I know that's a, that's a, not a popular position. And I, and I will cede, I, I look, I, I will cede to the masses. Most women like pussy hats. Actually, you know what? I don't know that that's true. I, I take that back. Enough of them like it that I'm certainly not going to like start a petition to, to ban them or anything. <laughs> Well, the the, uh, the obvious response is, didn't you hear that Donald Trump during the 2016 campaign was revealed to have bragged about grabbing women by the pussy? This is not complicated. Yeah. This is not this is not a badge of my identity. I, my vagina defines me. This is simply a political symbol to try to uh, undermine the uh, legitimacy of this asshole who's president of the United States. Yeah, I know. I mean, and the nevertheless, she persisted memes. I mean, all of these memes come out of these vile tone deaf things that these guys, mostly Donald Trump have said. Um, I guess it's, it's responding to him and it's responding to men rather than just standing on your own power. You know, so you know that you're familiar with this concept of punching up versus punching down. Oh yeah, I'm familiar with that. Oh, Megan, by the way, would you mind just moving yeah. a little oh, bit sorry. to your left? Because oh oh, the there's a, a bright light coming over your shoulder it's, that's, it's, it's that's very distracting. Uh, yes, because it's actually- There you go. Oh, oh, oh. oh, sorry. Right there. Perfect. Right here? That's okay, perfect. Yeah. Oh, oh, because I'm blocking yeah. it. Okay, it's there you go. It's a UFO. Yes. All right, I'm not going to <laughs> It's because I it's because I uh I criticize pussy hats. It's actually they're they're coming after me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's perfect. that's perfect. Okay, so because the minute I move my head it's going to go the other way. So, you know, in comedy, your the the principle is you cannot make fun of people who have more power than you. You can you, you can't make fun of people who have less power. Less power. Okay, punching down, yeah. So, you know, we have this thing now in social justice circles, this is, you know, sort of misapplied intersectionality in my point of view, where, you know, it's okay, it's cool, it's acceptable to bash men, to make fun of white men, because it's assumed that they have more power than you do. Well, that kind of bothers me because the majority of men don't really have any more power than, than the majority of women. And so to, to sort of excuse this kind of casual, jokey misandry by saying, oh, well, we're, we're just punching up to power is to me actually handing them power that they don't necessarily have. It's like we're taking our own power and giving it to them. So it's like a jujitsu move against yourself. And <laughs> so I thought, you know, the, the, the obsessing over every single thing Trump says 
to me, it just feels like you're, you're handing him your own power. Like the grab them by the pussy thing. Look, I, I was as stupid as anyone else. I thought that that would finally be the thing that took him down. I'm, I would take anything that would take him down. I, I, whatever it takes. But like, honestly, I, that moment, it, it didn't offend me. It just, it's, and it's not even locker room talk. It's shock jock talk. If you listen to Howard Stern, yeah. if you listen to morning zoo shows, anything like that, that's the sensibility of that kind of comment. It's not locker room. It's, it's performative. It's something else. And so to characterize it as locker room talk that all men do or that the wrong kind of men do was just to sort of like frame that all wrong, in my opinion. Yeah. But, you know, I'm a longtime Howard Stern listener, so you shouldn't uh, believe anything I say. I, I, the, I, you, the, the Glenn show and Howard Stern show, my favorite two shows. Oh, get out of here, really. <laughs> <Not even laughs> Appreciate that. Company. <laughs> well, I gotta I gotta say this because when I read your piece in Medium Nuance, a love story, and saw my name mentioned, uh, along with yes. John McWhorter, my colleague, the Glenn Show at Blogging Heads, the Black Guys, uh I, I was very happy. I thought that was that was quite sweet. And uh the very kind letter that you included in the copy of the book that you sent to me was also very sweet. So I want to thank you for that publicly. Well, I'm as you know that you your talks with with uh, John McWhorter were what really um, started my path into all these sorts of dissenting voices. So it was okay. all started there. Well, let's hope that our talk here today gets somebody on a similar path. I think it might have a chance of doing that, okay. as well as eliciting some fierce, uh, you know, counter uh, pushback kind of reaction too. I'm sure that that's coming. Brace yourself. That's the idea. Okay. Bring it on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Megan Dom, for coming on the Glenn Show. Appreciate it. Thank you, Glenn. Have a good okay. holiday. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.